Chapter 7 Assault The helicopter was coming in for a landing, Alexander went on. We all watched it land without saying a word. The two crewmen got out, came over to where we were standing, and fixed their eyes, too, on Anastasia. A group of armed, robust fellows silently stood watching this lone figure in an old cardigan standing before them, and immediately it was clear to all. They must capture this woman. The only question was, what was the most accommodating way to make the capture? After a long pause, Boris Moisevich laid it down in black and white. Anastasia, you realize you represent a valuable resource for science. The decision has already been made to transfer you to the nature preserve near Moscow. This is necessary for your own good, among other things. If for some reason you do not understand the situation and refuse to come voluntarily, we shall be obliged to effect the transfer by force. Naturally, you will want to have your child with you in your new place. You show us the location of your glade in the map, and, on, and the helicopter will go fetch your son. Later we can capture a few of the animals and transport them to your new dwelling place. I repeat, all this is necessary for your own benefit, for the benefit of your son and other people as well. You do want to bring benefit to people, don't you? Yes, Anastasia replied calmly, and right away added, Everything I know I am ready to share with all people if they find it interesting, but only with all people. Science is not something that is available to everybody at once. Its achievements are used first only by localized groups, often for their selfish personal interests. The vast majority get to know about only what the localized groups are disposed to reveal. Who do you represent? Is it not a particular localized group? I cannot go with you. I need to raise a man. I need to raise my son. That can only be done properly where a space of love has been created. This space has been created and perfected by my forebears, near and distant. It is still small, but it is what ties me to the whole substance of the universe. Every man must create around himself his own space of love, and offer it to his child. Bearing children without preparing a space of love for them is criminal. Every man must create around himself a small space of love, and if everyone understood this and acted upon it, then the whole earth would become the brightest focus of love in the universe. This is the way he wanted it, and this is man's purpose, for only man is capable of creating such a space. Two strong security men approached Anastasia from behind, one on either side. It wasn't clear whether they were acting in orders from the security captain or whether it had all been planned out in advance. They exchanged glances and simultaneously grabbed Anastasia's arms. They did this quite professionally, though not without a certain degree of apprehension. They kept a tight grip on her arms as though holding a captured bird by its outspread wings. The security captain was a stocky fellow, his hair cut real short. He stepped out in front and stood beside Boris Moisevich. Anastasia's face showed no sign of fear, but she was no longer looking at us. Her head was slightly inclined toward the ground, her eyelids were lowered, hiding her gaze. And she began to speak without raising her eyes, with the same calm and gentleness in her voice as before. Please do not use force. It is dangerous. For whom? the security captain inquired in a raspy voice. For you, and it would be unpleasant for me. Boris Moisevich tried to restrain what may have been either his fear or his excitement. He asked Anastasia, Can you cause us physical pain using supernatural abilities? I am man, a man like anybody else, but I am worried. Worry may allow undesirable things to happen. Such as? Matter, cells, atoms, nuclei, nuclear particles in chaotic movement. You know about them. If one visualizes them vividly and in full detail, perceives and understands them properly, properly, and then uses the full power of one's imagination to extract from the nucleus even a single chaotically moving particle, then the matter begins, begins to... Anastasia turned her head to one side, lifted her eyelids just slightly, and fixed her gaze on a stone lying on the ground. 
The stone immediately began to break apart into small particles and before long was transformed into a pile of sand. Then she raised her gaze to the security captain, squinting her eyes into a concentrated stare. Steam began to escape from the tip of the security captain's left ear. The tendon slowly, millimeter by millimeter, began to disappear. And suddenly the young guard standing beside him went white with fear and drew his pistol from its holster. He did it automatically, like a professional soldier, without thinking. He aimed the pistol directly at Anastasia and discharged the whole cartridge. No doubt the thoughts of each of us at that moment were racing at top speed, and something happened which you occasionally hear about with soldiers in wartime. When in extreme conditions they see a grenade or a bullet in motion, and even though the grenade or bullet is flying at its usual speed, the acceleration of one's thinking and perceptive facilities causes it to be seen in slow motion. I watched as the bullets from the frightened security guard gun security guard's gun flew at Anastasia one after another. The first bullet grazed her temple. The rest of the bullets never reached her. They dissolved into dust while still in flight, just like the stone which she had trained her gaze upon earlier. We all stood there stupefied. We stood and watched as a stream of blood flowed down Anastasia's cheek from under her kerchief. The guards, holding Anastasia by the arms, stepped back from her when they heard the gunshots, but didn't let go of her. They had got her in a death grip and were pulling her in opposite directions. All at once, a pale bluish glow flooded the ground in, around us. It came from somewhere up above and quickly intensified. It dazzled us, making us incapable of moving or speaking. In the unusual quiet that followed, we heard Anastasia say, Please let go of my arms. I may not be able to... Let go, please. But the petrified guards did not let go their death grip. Now I realize why she raised her arm in a characteristic gesture when she was talking with you. It was this gesture that indicated to someone up above that everything was in order and that she did not need help. But this time they wouldn't let her raise her arm. The bluish glow continued to intensify, then something seemed to sparkle, and we saw. We saw a fiery sphere hanging over us, pulsating with a pale blue light. It was like a huge ball of lightning, and inside it were sparkling networks of hundreds of lightning discharges. Occasionally they would spark out beyond the blue membrane-like hull and reach the tops of nearby trees or even the flowers beneath our feet, but caused them no harm. One of the thin lightning bolts momentarily made contact with an obstruction which rocks and a fallen tree had made in the creek. It transformed the obstruction into a cloud of dust which instantly vaporized. The bolts that sparked out beyond the blue hull of the fiery sphere no doubt possessed tremendous power of, en of energy we know nothing about. It seemed as though it were being controlled by some kind of intelligence. We had the impression of being in the presence of an intelligent being which possessed unimaginable power. But the most incredible and unnatural thing about what was taking place were the sensations we felt from its presence. We had no sense of fear or suspicion. On the contrary. You can just imagine, right there in a situation like that we began to feel a sense of calm and grace as though something very close to us, something related to us, had suddenly appeared. At that point, the pulsating blue sphere soared over our heads and seemed to be studying us, sizing up the situation. All at once, it made a circle in the air and landed at Anastasia's feet. The bluish glow intensified and, like a pleasing languor, re relaxed us to the point where we simply didn't feel like moving or even hearing or saying anything. The blue hull of the sphere then emitted several fiery, fiery bolts at once. They swept over to Anastasia, began touching her as though stroking the toes of her bare feet. Anastasia managed to free her arms from the languishing security guards. She stretched out her arms toward the sphere. Immediately it rose to the level of her face, and the lightning bolts, which we had seen with our eyes, turned to dust. The stones piled up in the creek began to fondle her arms while doing them no harm. Anastasia began talking with the sphere. We couldn't distinguish any words, but judging by her gestures and facial expression, she was trying to explain something to it, to prove or persuade it of the way she was seeing something, but without success. 
The sphere gave no response to her, but it was nevertheless clear that it was not agreeing with her. This much was evident, since Anastasia went on trying to persuade it with considerable excitement. It was the excitement that no doubt caused her cheeks to flush. Still, talking away, she removed her kerchief. Golden wheat-colored braids of hair hung about Anastasia's shoulder and covered the stream of dried blood on her face. We saw how perfectly beautiful her facial features were. The fiery sphere made several revolutions like a comet around Anastasia's head, then stopped once more in front of her face, and a thousand delicate lightning bolts swept through her golden hair, neatly touching each individual strand, lifting and stroking them. One of the bolts lifted a whole bunch of strands at once and opened the bullet wound in her temple, while another bolt began gliding along the traces of dried blood. It was as though the sphere was using the actions of its lightning bolts in place of words to remind Anastasia about what had happened to contradict her arguments. Finally, all the little bolts drew back inside the sphere. Anastasia lowered her head and fell silent. The sphere made one more revolution around her and then rose into the air. The bluish glow decreased in intensity, and we felt things gradually return toward the way they were before. But instead of the bluish light, a brown smoke now began rising from the earth. This smoke filled the whole space around us, and only Anastasia remained in a little circle of blue. And when this brownish smoke completely enveloped us, that was when we began to discover what hell really is. Chapter 8. What Hell Is Old Bible pictures showing the beastly torture of sinners over hot coals and even the most extreme portrayals of horror film monsters pale like children's innocent fairy tales in comparison to the hell we went through there on the river bank, Alexander exclaimed. Since the beginning of time, mankind has never managed to dream up anything that can compare with it. All the Bible images and horror films stop at depicting all the different ways fleshy bodies can be torn apart and dismembered, which is nothing by comparison with real hell. But what could be more frightful than the acute torturing of the flesh, I queried? What kind of hell did you see? Once the blue glow had weakened sufficiently to allow the brownish smoke to rise from the earth, and it had enveloped us completely from head to toe, we found ourselves split into two halves. What two halves? Just imagine, I suddenly found myself comprised of two component parts. The first was my body, enveloped in a transparent skin through which I could see all my internal organs, my heart, stomach, intestines, the blood rushing through my veins, along with various other organs. The other part, invisible, consisted of my feelings, emotions, my mind, my desires, my pain sensibility, in other words, everything about man that you can't see. What's the difference whether the parts are together or separated as long as it's still you? What happened to you that was so awful aside from seeing your skin transparent? The difference turned out to be incredibly significant. The thing is, our bodies began to act on their own, independently of our minds, wills, aspirations, or desires. We could observe the actions of our bodies from an external viewpoint, yet our feelings and pain sensibilities remained with our invisible selves, and we were deprived of any ability to influence the action of our own bodies. Like someone who's terribly drunk? Drunks don't see themselves externally, at least not while they're drunk. Whereas we saw and felt everything, our clarity of consciousness was extraordinarily acute. I could see how the beautiful, the grass, the flowers, and the river looked. I could hear the birds singing and the creek burbling away. I could feel the cleanness of the air around me along with the warmth of the sunbeams. But those bodies, all the transparent bodies standing in our group suddenly trotting down like a herd of sheep to a pond formed by the creek. The pond resembled a little lake. The water in it was clear and transparent. The bottom was covered with soft sand and beautiful stones. Tiny fish were swimming in it. Our bodies ran down to this splendid little lake and started splashing around in it. They started urinating and defecating in it. The water became dirty and clouded, yet our bodies began drinking from it. I saw the dirty, stinking liquid flow through my intestines and into my stomach. I was overcome with a sensation of nausea and revulsion. 
Then, under one of the trees by the pond, all at once appeared the naked bodies of two women. Their skin was just as transparent as that of our bodies. The women's bodies lay down on the grass under the tree, lolling about and stretching out in the warm sun. My body and that of the security captain ran over to the women's bodies. My body began stroking the one of one of the women's bodies. It felt a responding caress and entered into sexual intercourse with the woman's body. The security captain's approach was not reciprocated, and his body started raping the woman. Then one of the guards came running over and started hitting first my spine and then my head with a rock. But it was I, not my body, that felt excruciating pain. The guard dragged my body away from the woman's and started raping her himself. Our body soon began to grow old and decrepit. It was as though time was accelerating everything. The woman that had just been raped now became pregnant, and through her transparent skin you could see the embryo taking form and enlarging itself in the womb. The body of the scientist, Boris Moisevich, went over to the pregnant woman and spent some time peering attentively through her transparent skin at the developing embryo. Then all of a sudden he slipped his hand into the woman's vagina and began wrenching out the fetus. In the meantime, Stanislav's body was quickly collecting rocks into a pile, then wildly breaking off small trees and using them, along with any other materials he found handy, to construct something resembling a cabin. My body went over to help. When the cabin was just about finished, my body tried to kick Stanislav's body out of the cabin. He resisted, and our bodies started fighting with each other. Even though I myself was vi invisible, I could still feel terrible pain when he started hitting the legs and head of my body. Our fight caught the attention of the other bodies, and they shoved us both out of the cabin and then started fighting for it amongst themselves. My body became terribly frail and began decomposing before my very eyes. It could no longer walk and just lay there under a bush, wasting away with a nauseating stench. Worms appeared on my body, and I could feel them crawling all over me, creeping into my internal organs and eating away at them. I acutely felt them gnawing at my insides and awaited the final decom decomposition of my body to escape from this excruciating torture. Then, all at once, a fetus emerged from the second woman that had been raped. It began to grow right before my eyes. Soon the little fellow stood up and took its first timid step, then another, then it staggered and fell on its bottom. I could feel a painful sensation as it landed, and I realized to my horror that this was my new body, and it was doomed to survive, to exist among these abominable brainless bodies which were desecrating themselves and everything around. I realized that I, who was invisible, would never die, and that I was condemned to eternal contemplation and an acute awareness of the nastiness of everything that was going on, experiencing physical and even, even more terrible pain. The same thing was happening with the other bodies. They decayed, decomposed, and were born again. With each new birth, our bodies simply switched roles. There was hardly any vegetation left around. In its place where ugly structures had appeared, and the once pristine pond had been transformed into a stinking cesspool. Alexander fell silent. I, too, felt a sense of revulsion from what he had said, but not pity. Indeed, I said, you all went through a horrible experience, but you vermin had it coming to you. How come you had to latch on to Anastasia? She lives all alone in the taiga. She doesn't touch anybody or ask, doesn't ask for housing. She doesn't require a pension or any kind of an amenities. So why go interfering with her? Alexander didn't give any sign of offense to my verbal attack on him. He simply sighed and responded, You know, you said... We went through an experience. But you see, it may seem hard to believe, but the thing is, I'm not completely out of it. I think those who were in our group, too, haven't fully come out of it. What do you mean, haven't fully? Here you are, sitting calmly beside me, poking the ashes in the fire. Yeah, sure, I'm sitting here poking the ashes, but that acute awareness of something terrible has stayed with me. It still frightens me. This terrible thing is not just in the past. It is still going with us today, right now, with all of us. Maybe something's happening with you, but everything's okay with me and everyone else. But it doesn't seem to you, Vladimir, that the situation we were in is an exact copy of what mankind is doing today? What we were shown in a micro 
in a microcosm and at an accelerated speed only reflects what is going on today in the world. It doesn't seem that way to me, since our skin is not transparent and our bodies obey our commands. Maybe someone's just taking pity on us, not letting us become fully aware of what we have done and are continuing to do. After all, if we were aware of it, if we could see our lives from an external viewpoint, we would see them exposed along with all the false teachings which we've used through the ages to justify what we are doing. We wouldn't last, we'd go out of our minds. We try to put on a decent front, we try to justify the evil we do by, by our own so-called insurmountable weaknesses. We couldn't resist temptation, we started smoking and drinking, committed murder, then we started going to war to defend some sort of ideals. We started setting off bombs. We are weak. That's the way we see ourselves today. We say there are higher powers, they can do everything, they decide everything, but as for us, we hide behind dogmas like that and feel we can get away with any kind of filth we like. And let's face it, what we do is filth. We all do it, every one of us, only we justify it to ourselves in different ways. But now it is absolutely clear that as long as my consciousness has not lost its control over my body, I and I alone must take personal responsibility for all its actions. And Anastasia is right when she says, as long as man is in the flesh. Don't go citing Anastasia, smartass. She is right. But you, yourself, practically had her in the grave. Too bad she didn't go just a little further, and then you would have all lost your marbles completely. I was really growing more and more angry at the whole bunch of them, but since Alexander was the only one in front of me, he had to bear the brunt of my anger. Just look at your own self, Alexander replied. Wasn't it thanks to you that we were able to get through to Anastasia? And not just us. You think attempts like ours won't be repeated? Whatever possessed you to specify the exact name of your ship, even the name of your captain, don't play the documentarian. You could even have changed the name of the river, but you didn't do it. You didn't think of it in time. And here you expect others to always know the right thing to do? I got what was coming to me. Now my whole life I will have to keep making sense of that nightmare I witnessed. Tell me, how did it end, that nightmare of yours? How did you get out of it? We would never have been able to come out of it all on our own. It was something we were going on reliving forever. At least, that was the impression each of us had. Anastasia appeared amidst our decomposing and still active bodies. Her skin wasn't transparent. She was still wearing her old cardigan and long skirt. She tried speaking to our bodies, but they wouldn't listen. They seemed to be programmed to die and be born again, repeating their actions over and over with only a change of roles. At that point, Anastasia started quickly picking up the garbage near one of the structures our body had built. She quickly gathered the scattered stones and brush into a pile with her hands, loosened the earth a little with a stick, touched and fluffed up the grass where we had trampled it, and the little green blades began popping up again. Not all, but those that still could. Anastasia carefully straightened the broken trunk of a small tree, about a meter tall. She mashed up some earth in her hands to soften it, and then daubed it on the broken part of the tree. She squeezed the tree between her hands and held it tight for a while. Then, when she carefully took her hands away, the tree remained upright. Anastasia nimbly went on doing what she had to do. She created a small oasis on the ground our bodies had trampled, which had been left almost devoid of vegetation. Boris Moisevich's body ran over to it, leapt onto the grass, and rolled around on it, then jumped up and ran off. A little while later, it returned with the body of one of the guards. Together, they uprooted the small tree and began dragging stones and sticks to the oasis, where they attempted to put together yet another ugly-looking plain structure. Anastasia threw up her hands in frustration. She tried talking to them, but as she, as she met no response, she apparently abandoned her efforts at persuasion. After standing for a while, while in a dither about what to do next, she dropped to her knees, covered her face with her hands, and you could see the hair trembling on her shoulders. Anastasia was crying, crying just like a baby. And almost immediately the bluish glow reappeared, 
At first, barely noticeable, it drove down the brownish smoke of our hell into the ground and reunited our bodies and our minds. Only we still weren't able to move about. But this time it wasn't from horror, but from a sweet and pleasant languor emanating from the blue glow. The fiery sphere was again circling overhead. Anastasia stretched out her hands toward it. The sphere instantly changed location to within a meter of her face. She began talking with it. And this time I could distinguish words, Anastasia told the sphere. Thank you, you are kind. Thank you for your mercy and your love. The people will understand. They will most certainly understand everything. They will understand it in their hearts. Do not ever take your beautiful blue light from the earth, your light of love. Anastasia smiled and a tiny tear rolled down her cheek. From the sphere's pale blue membrane hull, fiery lightning bolts flew into her face. Carefully and dex dex dexterously, they picked up the tear on her cheek, glistened it in the sun, and ever so delicately, as though it were a priceless gem, held the tear on their fiery tips as they placed it inside the sphere. The sphere gave a shudder, executed a circle around Anastasia, landed momentarily at her feet, then swept upward and dissolved into the blue sky above, leaving everything on the ground the way it was before. And there we were, standing where we had been before. The sun was shining, the river was flowing as it had always done, the forest could be seen rising in the distance, and there was Anastasia standing in front of us, right where she had been earlier. We stood there silently, taking in everything around us. I was overjoyed by what I saw. And I think the others were, too. Only we weren't talking, perhaps because of what we had experienced in the natural surroundings which had suddenly become so beautiful to our gaze. Alexander fell silent, as though he had quite withdrawn into himself. I tried speaking to him. Listen, Alexander, maybe everything you told me really didn't happen that way at all. Maybe Anastasia is simply able to use some sort of powerful hypnosis. I've read that there are many recluses who can do that, so maybe she hypnotized you and showed you a vision. Hypnosis, did you say? Did you notice the gray streaks in my hair? Yes, I did. Those gray streaks appeared after all this happened. But you could have got a huge fright under hypnosis and that caused the gray streaks. Well, if you assume it was hypnosis, then there's another mystery you'll have to explain. And what's that? The stone and log obstruction in the creek. It's completely disappeared. The creek runs freely now. But the obstruction was there before our vision. Everybody saw it. It was there. Okay, that's something to think about. Anyway, what difference does it make what happened to us? There's something more important than that. I'm not the same person I was before. I don't know how to live now, what I should be studying or where. After I got home, I burnt a lot of my books written by so-called sages, wise men, teachers from various parts of the world. I had quite a decent-sized personal library. What did you go and do that for? You should have sold them if you no longer needed them. I couldn't sell them. I didn't even think of selling them. Now I have some accounts to settle with those teachers and sages. And what do you think, Alexander? Is it dangerous to communicate with Anastasia? Maybe she really is some kind of anomaly. After all, some of the letters I've got say that she represents another civilization. If that's true, then it'd be dangerous to commu communicate with her because you never know what this other civilization might have in mind. I think just the opposite is true, Alexander replied. She has such a feeling and love for the earth for everything living and growing on it, that compared to Anastasia, we look pretty much like vagrant aliens. Then who is she? Can scientists say for sure, once and for all? How did she manage to acquire such a huge mass of information? Where does she have room to store it in her head? Where did she get her mystifying abilities? What about her ray? I think we simply have to go by her words here. She said, I am man, I am wo a woman. As for all that information, I don't think she stores any of it in her head. I think rather that the purity of her thoughts allow her access to the database of the entire universe, and that her talents derive from this total access to information. The universe loves her, but she is wary of us, and that's why it won't open 
itself to us completely. Our thoughts, the thoughts of any man raised in today's society, are blocked by stereotypes and conventions. In contrast to her thought, which is completely open and free. That's why it's hard for us to explain her mysterious ability simply by her assertion that she is man. Of course, she can perform incredible feats, miracles in our perception. I know that from personal experience. During our visit, one other incident happened which can only be described as a miracle. It's even more mystifying than what happened with our group, and much grander. Alexander uttered these last few words with a certain degree of excitement in his voice. He got up and walked away from the fire into the night. In the twinkling light of the stars and the dusty glow from the smoldering fire, I could see the young Siberian lad pacing back and forth. I could hear his brief, excited phrases. Alexander was saying something incomprehensible about science and psychologists and some sort of teachings. I got tired of sitting there and listening to his fragmentary utterances. I was dying to hear what kind of grand miracle he had seen Anastasia perform. I tried to calm him down. Relax, Alexander, sit down. Tell me more specifically what grand thing you witnessed. Alexander tossed some dry branches into the fire and sat down again beside it. But I could see he had not fully regained his composure. Out of nervousness, no doubt, he had stirred the smoldering coals so forcefully that the sparks flying upward landed on him and on me, causing us to jump up and away from the fire. When things had quieted down, I began listening to his emotional tale. In the space of some twenty minutes, he began, Anastasia managed to change right before our eyes the physical condition of a little village girl. She did this before our very eyes. And over this period of time, she changed not only the little, the little girl's destiny, but her mother's too, and even had an effect on the whole outward appearance of this remote Siberian village. And it all happened within the space of twenty minutes or so. The main thing was how she did it. Simplicity itself. She... How can anyone believe in horoscopes after that? Alexander wondered. I saw it happen. That's why I burnt my books with all that wise man nonsense and all that religious stuff. See, I countered, you yourself admit that she performs superhuman miracles, mystical wonders, even if she smashes horoscopes in the process. She makes these things happen all by herself, and then she expects to be called a normal human being. If only she tried to act halfway normal, but no. I spoke to her about that, too. I said she should just act like everyone else, then everything will be normal. But it seems she's not capable of acting like everyone else. Pity. She's such a kind and beautiful woman, so smart. She can heal people, and she's born me a son. But to live with her the way I'd live with another woman, well, that's simply impossible. I can't imagine anybody being able to sleep with her after everything you've told me. Nobody could. Everybody needs a woman, plain and simple, not a far-out eccentric like that. But she herself is to blame for that. What with her mysticism and all? Hold on, Vladimir, now it's my turn to tell you something. Just think carefully about what I'm going to say. It may seem incredible, but try to understand. Everybody has to understand it. Everybody. Perhaps together we can make some sense out of it. Perhaps. You see, Vladimir... Anastasia performed this incredible miracle with the little girl, but there was no mystery or magic involved. No sorcery, no shamanistic gimmicks. If you can imagine, she, Anastasia, did this miracle using just simple human words known to everyone. Simple, everyday words, only spoken in the right place at the right time. If psychologists were to analyze Anastasia's conversation with this little village girl, they would realize how psychologically effective it is. Anyone uttering these same words could have achieved a similar effect. But to have these words come to mind at the right time, the sincerity and purity of thought Anastasia spoke of are an absolute requirement. So, it's not just good enough to memorize the words? We've all known them for a long time. That's not the point. The real question is, what lies behind each of the words we say? Somehow you're losing me. You'd better tell me the rest of what happened with you there. What words could change people's physical condition and their whole destinies? All right, of course I should explain. Listen. Chapter 9 When Words Change Destinies 
After what we experienced, Alexander began, our group took a while to regain a sense of normalcy. Nobody spoke with anyone else. We stood there right in the same spot, and it was only after some time had passed that we began to look to either side of us and take in the surrounding world in a different way from before, as though we were sensing it for the first time. And now we noticed a group of residents approaching us from the direction of the village. The local population was quite small. Only about a dozen people lived in the six houses of this remote Siberian settlement and they were ne nearly all oldsters, some of them quite frail. One woman was bent over double. She walked with a limp, carried a cane, but she still came with the others. Those who did not require a walking stick were armed with various tools. One carried a crossbeam, another an oar. They had evidently come to defend Anastasia. These old and frail people were advancing against young, healthy, stalwart fellows carrying weapons. They advanced without fear, determined to come to Anastasia's defense, no matter how, who might be standing in their way. Their resolve was terrifying. When they drew near to us, the old fellow carrying the oar and wearing rubber boots, who was walking slightly ahead of the others, stopped, which brought a halt to the group of villagers as a whole. They paid no attention to us, treating our group as empty space. With a sedate stroke of his beard, he looked right at Anastasia and greeted her respectfully. I wish you good health, my dear, dear Anastasia, on behalf of us all. Good day to you, kind people, Anastasia responded, clasping her hand to her breast and bowing to the elderly villagers. The water in the river is dropping early this year, the old fellow went on. The summer hasn't been too rainy. Not so rainy just now, Anastasia confirmed, but more rain will come. The water level will rise, and the river will return to its former strength. As they continued talking that way, out from the group of elderly villagers emerged a frail little girl, about six years old, with pale yellowish skin. She was wearing an old jacket pieced together from fragments of some adult garment, her th Thin legs were covered by patched pantyhose, and she had little old boots on her feet. Later, I found out the girl's name was Aniuta. She was a sickly child with a congenital heart disease. Her mother had brought her from the city when she was just six months old and left her with the oldsters, not coming back even once to see her daughter. They say she works somewhere as a painter for a construction firm. Aniuta went up to Anastasia and stared, started tugging on the hem of her skirt, pleading with her. Bend down, Auntie Anastasia, bend down to me. Anastasia looked at the little girl and squatted down in front of her. The girl quickly took off the old white kerchief she was wearing on her head. She salivated on one edge of the it and began to carefully wipe the blood which had already dried on Anastasia's face and temple, saying, you don't come any more, Auntie Anastasia, to sit on your little log by the shore. Grandpa said that earlier you used to come more often. You would sit on the log and watch the river. Now you don't come. Grandpa showed me the. Grandpa showed me the little log you used to sit, Auntie Anastasia. Grandpa showed me, and I started coming to it, to your log myself. I sat there, all alone, waiting for you to come, Auntie Anastasia. I really wanted to see you. I have a secret to tell you. But you wouldn't come to sit on your log and watch the river. Maybe because the log is quite old. I kept asking Grandpa, and he brought me a new little log for you. There it is, lying right beside the old one. The little girl took Anastasia by the hand and started pulling her over to the log. Let's go, let's go, Auntie Anastasia. Let's go sit on the new log. Grandpa hewed out two seats on it with his axe. I was the one who asked him to do that, so that when you came we could sit together. Anastasia at once responded to the little girl's request, and they sat down together on the log. They just sat there silently for a while, not paying any attention to anyone. It was as though there had been no one else around, and everyone stood silently without budging. Then the little girl started talking. Grandma told me a lot about you, Auntie Anastasia, and when my grandma died, I began asking Grandpa, and he told me about you, too. Whenever Grandpa talks about you, I think about my little secret I have to tell you. 
Grandpa told me that when I was little, my heart wasn't working right. It wasn't ticking evenly. One time its tick was way off. Then they brought in Auntie Doctor in a boat. Auntie Doctor said there was nothing they could do with such a bad heart. There was no one it would obey, and that I would die. it would die before long. Grandpa told me how you, Auntie Anastasia, were sitting at the time on your old lo little log and watching the river. Then you got up and came into our hut. You took me in your arms and put me on the grass outside the house. Then you lay down beside me and put your hand on my chest. You put your hand here, where you could hear my ticking, my heart ticking, right here, and the little girl clasped her hand to the left side of her thin little chest. Grandpa said that you too, Auntie Anastasia, started lying next to me as if you were breathless, since your own heart had started ticking ever so softly just like mine. Then your heart started beating faster and called out to mine to catch up. My heart obeyed yours, and together they started ticking the way they ought to. That is what Grandpa told me. Did he tell me everything right? Right, Auntie Anastasia? Yes, Aniuta. Your grandfather told you right. Your heart will always be good now. That means your heart called to mine, and mine obeyed? It obeyed, did it? Yes, Aniuta, dear, your heart obeyed. Now I shall tell you my secret, Auntie Anastasia. It is a very, very important secret. Tell me your important secret, Aniuta. Aniuta got up from the log and stood in front of Anastasia, clasping her thin little hands to her chest. Then all of a sudden she... Suddenly little Aniuta fell on her knees before Anastasia. She barely managed to restrain the excitement in her voice when she said, Auntie Anastasia, dear Auntie Anastasia, ask your heart again, ask it. Ask your heart to call to my mama's heart. Have my mama come see me. Even just for a day, to see me. That's my secret. Have your heart, mama's heart, heart. Aniuta choked from the emotion, then fell silent, her eyes fixed on Anastasia. Anastasia squinted her eyes and looked off into the distance, past the little girl kneeling in front of her. Then she looked at the girl once more and quietly stated a fact that must have been horrifying for the child. She answered as her as she answered her as she would have an adult. Aniuta, dear, my heart is unable to call to your mamma. Your mamma is far away in the city. She tried to find happiness, but did not find it. She does not have a home of her own. She does not have any money to buy you gifts. And unless she could bring you gifts, she does not want to come and see you. It is hard for her in the city. But if she should come and see you, it will be even harder for her. A visit with you would become a sad and tormenting experience. It would be more difficult and frightening for her to see you so sickly and so poorly clothed. She would see how the houses in your village are falling apart and how dirty and shabby the house you live in is. It would be all mo the more difficult since your mama no longer believes she can do anything good for you. She simply does not believe it. She feels she has tried everything and this is what fate has determined for her. She has given in to the very hopelessness she has imagined for herself. Little Aniuta listened to the terrible truth and her wee body trembled. It seemed to me awfully cruel to talk to a child that way. I thought a white lie would have been more appropriate here. Like stroking the poor little girl's head and promising her mother would arrive soon and saying they would have a happy meeting. But that is not what Anastasia did. She told this helpless, defenseless little girl the whole bitter truth. Then, after spending some time watching her body shake all over, she began talking to her again. I know, Aniuta, dear. You do love your mamma. I love, love, I love my poor dear Mamochka, the girl replied, the child's voice in the point of breaking into tears. Then you make your mamoshka happy. You are the only one, the only one in the whole world who can make her happy. It is very simple. You become healthy and strong and learn how to sing. You will be a singer. Your marvelous, pure voice will sing together with your heart. Your mama may meet you in twenty years and seeing you will make her very happy. Or your mama may come to see you next summer. By that time you should already be healthy and strong. To welcome her, get some presents ready for your mamoshka. 
Show her how strong and beautiful you are, and you will make your mamoshka very happy, and your meeting with her will be a joyful one indeed. But I will never be able to be healthy or strong. Why not? You know, Auntie Doctor, she wears a white coat. Auntie Doctor told Grandma. I heard her say I'll always be a weakling because I was a bottle baby. My mamma wasn't able to give me any mother's milk. My mamma had no milk in her breasts, and children, when they are small, always drink milk from their mamma's breasts. I saw it once when a lady came to the village with a little baby. I went over to the house she had come to. I really wanted to see how babies drink milk from their mother's teats. I tried to sit there ever so quietly, but they kept chasing me out. The mamma lady wondered why I was sitting there without blinking. I was afraid to blink my eyes in case I missed something. Do not you think, Anuita, that Auntie Doctor might have been mistaken when she said you would never be healthy and strong? How could she have been mistaken? She wears a white coat. Everybody listens to her. The grandfathers and grandmothers, she knows everything. She knows that I was a bottle baby. And why did you go to see how babies are breastfed? I thought I would see how good the baby felt when he got fed from his mother's teat. I thought I would see how he felt and I would feel better too. You will get better, Anuita, dear. You will be healthy and strong, Anastasia said quietly and confidently. And then Anastasia gradually unbuttoned her cardigan and exposed her breasts. Aniuta stared at the exposed breast in amazement, quite overwhelmed by the unexpected action. From the ends of the nipples, tiny drops of breast milk emerged. Milk! Mother's milk! Auntie Anastasia, are you feeding a baby too? Are you a mama? This milk is to feed my little son. Drops of breast milk kept coming. One of the drops fluttered in a passing breeze. The breeze tore the drop from Anastasia's breast. Like a lightning fast steel spring, Anas Anuita dashed after the little drop of breast milk, and she imagined this thin little sickly girt little girl was nimble enough to catch the drop. She fell to the ground, but as she was falling, she put out the palm of her hands and caught the little drop of breast milk. She caught it just as it reached the ground. Getting up on her knees, she lifted her cupped hands to her face and opened them, examining the tiny wet spot they were holding. Then she held out her hand to Anastasia. Here, I caught it. Here it is. Your son's milk is not lost. You saved the little drop, Aniuta. Now it belongs to you. To me? Yes, just to you. Aniuta raised her cup hands to her face and touched the drop with her lips. The frail little girl closed her eyes and held her hands pressed against her lips for a long time. Then she dropped her hands, looked at Anastasia, and with a voice full of gratitude whispered, Thank you. Come close to me, Aniuita, dear. Anastasia took hold of the little girl by her shoulder. She stroked her hair and then sat her on her lap. She gently inclined the little one's head to her breast, as she would an infant, and began singing quietly. Aniuta's lips were now very close to one of Anastasia's nipples. Almost in a half-sleep, Aniuta slowly drew her lips closer and closer to Anastasia's breast, felt the moist nipple, gave a tiny shudder, and began greedily sucking on Anastasia's milk-filled breast. Judging by the tape recording, she awakened about nine minutes later. She raised her head and jumped down from Anastasia's lap. I... oh... Dear, what have I done? I've drunk up your son's milk. Not to worry, Aniuta. There's enough left for him. You only drank the milk from one of my breasts, and there is still milk left in the other one. There's enough for him. My son can also eat pollen from the flowers if he wants to. And now you have been provided with all you need, so you will have no fear about being strong and beautiful and happy. Now go and draw your happiness from life, from each day it brings. I shall be strong and healthy. I shall think about how to greet Mamochka, so that she will not find it difficult to see me. But she will be extremely happy. Only I shan't be able to sing. I used to sing with Grandma. Then Grandma died. I keep asking Grandpa, but he doesn't sing. Only when he drinks vodka will he sing me a song, and then I sing along with him. But it's hard for me to sing along with him, because his voice croaks. I also tried to sing along with the radio, but our old receiver crackles so much I can't get the words. Aniuta, dear, just try singing without words. 
Try to imitate the birds when you hear them sing, or the water when it burbles, or the rustling of the leaves when the wind is in it strong and whistles through the branches. And there are a lot of other sounds in there are a lot of sounds in the grass. You will hear many pure sounds around you if you are willing to listen. Try imitating them with your voice. They will be your best teachers. I am going now, Anita. Goodbye. It is time for me to go. Anastasia got up from the log. Aniuta remained sitting, listening to the world around her. Anastasia went up to the young guard who had shot at her. The guard was still very pale in the face, and his hands were shaking. His pistol was lying nearby on the ground. Anastasia told the guard, Do not blame yourself. Do not torture your soul. It was not a partner in what you did. You acted out of instinct. You were trained to protect whatever you were ordered to, without thinking about the situation, and your instinct took its course. It's not good for instinct to gain supremacy in man. When instinct takes first place, then man takes second place. The result is something less than a man. Think about it. Perhaps it would be better to return to yourself, to the man that you are. When the guard heard the calming tones of Anastasia's voice, his hands stopped shaking and the paleness disappeared from his face. And by the time she had finished speaking, his face was flushed with a reddish color right to the tips of his ears. Then Anastasia said goodbye to the elderly villagers and headed off in the direction of the taiga. For a long time we watched her as she drew further and further away. Then all at once we heard an extraordinarily pure child's voice singing. Aniuta was still sitting on the log, singing a beautiful old-time song, probably one she had learned from her grandmother. And how she sang! Her pure voice hit unusually high notes, filling the space around and enchanting the heart. Sprinkling raindrops glisten, brother rocks his sister, brother rocks his sister, sings to her, she listens. Aniuta finished her song and began staring at our group, still standing there motionless. Then she got up, picked up a thin stick from the ground and said, You chaps are bad. You're so big, but you're still bad. After saying this, she started coming at us, armed with the little stick. The elderly group of villagers shuffled silently along behind her, and all of us, to a man, began withdrawing before them. We retreated right back to our ship, which was docked by the river bank, then scrambled up the gangplank, not without some pushing and shoving. We were on the point of pulling up the gangplank when the captain suddenly noticed the two helicopter pilots were also on board. "'How come you're here?' he shouted from the bridge. "'Who's looking after the chopper?' The pilots jumped down from the ship and ran over to their copter. We left, abandoning the barrels of fuel and tents remaining on the shore." Nobody even thought of collecting them. Chapter 10 Work Out Your Own Happiness When Alexander finished his story, I couldn't help expressing my animosity toward him. I see only too well what you're up to. So you left the tents there, and the barrels too, eh? Too bad you got away with just some gray hair. She's a holy person, Anastasia. It was so clear straight off. Any normal person who had seen you would have twigged what was going on right off the bat. They would have known who was standing in front of them and what they were getting at. And yet she started pouring out her soul to you. She was aware of everything, Alexander observed. She was aware of why we came and what we, were, what we wanted of her. She understood. But she was not talking with the dark side of our human selves. She ignored the dark side, communicating only with what was bright in each one's heart. And that way she changed all of us. After all, I'm an academic. I've done a lot of work in psychology. So another academic, eh? So what good is all your study if your thoughts are so slow to catch up? Well, you see, life often happens to deal out its events to us faster and more accurately than we can handle them. Besides, Anastasia turned out to be... No, I'm afraid to put her into a category any more than that other experience. What other experience? How can I put it? You know, those old people from that remote Taiga village. Well, they're still coming at us together with the frail little girl out in front of them, carrying the thin stick. 
What? Where? They're coming at us. They're coming at all of us who were there and saw them. I thought that this was happening just with me. As soon as I close my eyes, I see them straight off, and sometimes they appear whenever I do anything which, in their opinion, is probably unwarranted. I thought this was happening with just me, but I've been talking with others in the group. Similar things have been happening with the ones who were there. But that's all just in your minds, in your imagination. What's the difference? We still have to retreat before their advance, even in our minds. What could be so frightening about helpless and unarmed oldsters? What are you afraid of? I really don't know what there is to be afraid of. Maybe our own? Maybe we've overstepped some line of permissiveness. What kind of line would that be? That sort of fantasizing can drive one crazy. Maybe you just have to think of things through as you're doing them before it's too late. Maybe. Think, think things through in time. We all have to think things through. And where did you get the notion that after her conversation with Anastasia, the little girl's destiny changed, and her mother's too, and the destiny of the other villagers? I told you, I'm into psychology. As an academic, I can say this, Anastasia completely changed Aniuta's whole internal program. After being abandoned to the care of her grandparents, the little girl had been spending her time sitting sick and helpless in a corner of a dirty hut, waiting for her mother to come. They kept assuring her that her mamochka would come and play with her and bring her presents. They did this, thinking they were doing a good deed by lying. In the meantime, her mother in the city went on a drinking binge to relieve her feeling of hopelessness. The false assurances had condemned the girl to a state of fruitless expectancy. We too sometimes sit around waiting for a dispensation from above. Someone is supposed to come along and make us happy and change our destiny. Maybe that's why we act so lethargically or don't act at all. We don't reflect on the fact that we already have more than enough, and that maybe we should be greeting the one coming with gifts of our own. Anastasia changed destiny and the future with her simplicity and sincerity. Just think, the simplest human words can change destiny. I've listened to the recording of Anastasia's conversation with Aniuta many times. I have an idea. If anyone else spoke that way to the girl, it would have had the same effect. It doesn't actually make, take much to speak the way she did. The main thing is not to lie. One need only to have the sincere desire to help. And helping doesn't mean just sympathizing. You have to be free of doctrines of karma or predestination or rather rise above them. Of course, one can do a lot of talking about karma, the hopelessness of inevitable predestination and what it means for a sick little girl, but Anastasia rose above the sense of inevitability. She simply didn't pay any attention to it. Any other person could do the same. After all, everything was done with words, simple words we use every day. Only they need to be spoken at the right time and in the right place and in the proper order. It is quite possible that the purity of thought Anastasia talks about causes these words to automatically fall into place in the right sequence, and that is why they are so powerful. Well, Alexander, those are all theories of yours, assumptions. You still have to look at real life and see whether any destinies will change on account of a bunch of words or not. Anyway, what could possibly change in life for that little girl, unless some sort of miracle happened? A miracle has happened. It turns out that all the miracles we need are within ourselves. What kind of miracle happened? Little Aniuta, whole mind and life got reprogrammed. She broke all the bonds of karma for herself and those around her. What do you mean broke? How do you know this? I know. Some time afterward I went back to the village. I decided to offer Aniuta my radio receiver since hers was too crackly and set up an antenna for for it on the roof. So I'm walking along to Aniuta's house and I notice that the boards on the wooden sidewalk have been fixed. Before they were quite decayed and now all the rotting boards have been replaced with new ones. Wow, I thought. What's this renovation going on here? I saw Aniuta's granddad sitting on the porch, washing his boots in a pail of water. I said hello to him and explained why I had come. Well, fine, said the grandfather. Come on in, if you like. Only you'll have to take off those shoes of yours. You see, we've got new rules around the place. 
I took off my shoes on the porch and accompanied the grandfather into the hut. Everything was simple inside, as you would expect in a small village, only extremely clean and cozy. You see, our granddaughter's got this new order set up for us, the grandfather told me. She worked at it for a long time. She cleaned the floor and then washed everything spick and span. She was at it from morning till night for over a week, like a wound up spring. She would have a rest and then start cleaning again. She persuaded me to paint the walls a fresh coat of white. And now, when I come into the hut with my boots on and leave tracks, right away she gets out a rag and starts cleaning away the tracks. So, I guess it's better not to leave any tracks. We don't have any slippers. Instead of slippers, she adapted some old galoshes. Here, you can put these on. Make yourself comfortable. I sat down at the table. It was covered with an old but clean tablecloth. The cloth was torn in one place and the tear was patched as neatly as a child's hand could make it with a piece of colored cloth cut in the shape of a bunny rabbit. In the middle of the table stood a cut glass tumbler out of which corners cut from the notepad sheets neatly protruded instead of serviettes. I see they've started improving your village too, I said to the grandfather. And it looks like the authorities have been paying attention, seeing they fixed the wooden sidewalks. And he replied, It's got nothing to do with the authorities. They don't pay any attention to us. It's my granddaughter, Aniuta. She just can't keep still. What do you mean, Aniuta? She's still a wee one. Much too little to repair sidewalks. Those are heavy boards there. Heavy boards, yeah. You see, one day I was about to set out hunting, and I asked a neighbor if she would look in on Aniuta. And Aniuta says to me, Go on, Grandpa, go on about your business. Don't worry, I'll take care of everything myself. Just let me take a saw to that board that's standing against the wall in the barn. I was surprised, but I thought, Why not let the child play, if that's the way she likes to play? So I put the board on the wood block, handed her a couple of saws, and set off to do some hunting. Later, my neighbor told me what happened while I was gone. Aniuta pulled the, pulled the old rotten pieces of board from the sidewalk. She measured the hole with a string and began sawing the board I had given her according to the measurement. The neighbor says she spent half the day sawing the board, but she managed to do it somehow. Then she lugged the new board right up to the sidewalk and put it in place of the rotten one. She's so thin and frail, how on earth could she have lugged such a heavy board, I asked. She found herself a helper. Back a couple of months ago, she made friends with an orphan dog, a Siberian Laika. An old lady died who lived at the other end of our village, leaving a large dog. Back at the funeral, Aniuta kept stroking him. Then she started taking him something to eat. At first, the Laika wouldn't leave his own yard, even though there was nobody left living in the hut. The old lady had been living alone. Aniuta fed the dog for several days. He started following the, little, the girl around, and now he never leaves her side. Now this old dog helps carry out whatever our granddaughter fancies. So he helped her lug the board over. Aniuta tied a string around the end and started in dragging it herself. When the huge dog grasped hold of the other end with his teeth and, began, and between the two of them, they managed to drag it to the sidewalk. Then Aniuta asked a neighbor lady for some nails and borrowed my hammer. And here she was trying to nail the board into place with the hammer, but nothing happened. The neighbor saw Aniuta sitting on the sidewalk trying to hammer in the nail. She hit her hand in the process and blood started oozing out. The dog was sitting right beside her, watching and whimpering. The neighbor came over, took the hammer, and nailed the board in place. The next evening, she saw Aniuta and the dog dragging another board over, which meant there was another hole in the sidewalk to patch up. The neighbor asked Aniuta if she were going to patch up all the holes this way. Couldn't she think up some other little girl's thing to do? And my granddaughter replied, It is very important, Auntie, for all the sidewalks outside the houses to be new and free from holes. You see, otherwise, someone might decide to come visiting, walking along the boards, and there's holes in them, and that would spoil the visitor's good mood. And my mamushka, when she comes, might get upset if she saw such a, such a shoddy sidewalk. So the neighbor hammered down the second board for her, and then she raised a hue and cry throughout the village, shouting to everyone, Get busy fixing the sidewalks in front of your houses. I'm not going to let a child do drudgery on account of your disorderliness. She's working her hands to the bone. 
So, you can see, everyone's fixed up the sidewalk in front of their houses, so they wouldn't have to hear the neighbor lady rail at them anymore. And where is your granddaughter now? I asked the old fellow. She's lugged a tin of paint over to the house at the far end. She'll probably spend the night there with the old Losin couple. Yeah, she may spend the night there. What kind of paint? What, and what's it for? Just ordinary oil-based paint, bright orange. She got it from the steamship in exchange for fish. That's her latest fancy. And what kind of fancy might that be? She's decided that all the huts need freshening up, need to look more cheerful. So when the ship comes, that's the ship that collects fish that's been caught around here, she goes and offers them a whole catch of fish in exchange for paint. And then she lugs the tin of paint to, the, to one of the huts. She asks them to paint the nalichniks, and the old people start painting. Soon it'll be my turn. What do you know? I'll do the painting. Why not? Maybe it'll be better if the painting gets done, if the huts are going to look more cheerful on the outside. And where does she get the fish from? She catches them herself. Every morning she brings home two or three connies, sometimes more. If only once she'd come home empty-handed, but no, the fish just seemed to land on her hooks all by themselves. And here I'm lying in bed with my back problems, and she says to me, Get up! And keeps at me, Get up, Grandpa! You gotta salt the fish so it doesn't go bad. Every morning it's the same, the old fellow muttered, with no trace of annoyance in his voice. So I asked him how Aniuta managed to cope with the fishing tackle all by herself. See, I told you, he replied, Aniuta's got a helper, this Siberian Laika. He may be old, but he's smart and obedient. He helps her carry out all her fancies. Aniuta takes my throw line with its five hooks, neatly arranges the bait on the hooks, and goes down to her treasured spot on the river bank every evening with her Laika. She'll tie one end of the line to, to a post on the shore, then attaches the other end to a stick. The dog then takes the stick in his mouth and swims out to the river. He keeps on swimming as long as Aniuta, standing on the shore, keeps encouraging him. Swim, Drushok! Swim, Drushok! The dog keeps pulling the line until Aniuta changes her tone of her voice and she calls, Come here, Drushok! Come here, Drushok! Then the dog releases the stick from his jaws and swims back to shore. Well, that's enough for now. Let's get some sleep. With that, the old fellow climbed onto the stove, and I lay down on the wooden sofa. When I woke up at dawn, I went outside and saw Aniuta down by the river, tugging on the iron ring to which the fishing line was attached. A huge Siberian Laika was helping her. The Laika had grasped hold of the ring with his teeth and braced himself with his legs as he backed up. Together, they were dragging the line with quite a decent catch on the end of it. Aniuta was wearing rubber boots three sizes too big over her bare feet. Once the catch was almost at the shore, she took hold of a scoop net and ran down to collect the fish. The Laika was standing on his hind legs, holding the ring in his teeth. Aniuta went into the water deeper than her boots allowed, and the water started pouring over the tops of her boots. She drew the catch into the river bank and, and unhooked three splendid fish, which she put into a bag. Then she and the Laika together took hold of the rope attached to the piece of plywood carrying the bag and dragged it home. The water was sloshing around in Aniuta's boots, interfering with her walking. She stopped and took off her boots, first one, then the other, and stood barefoot on the cold ground while she emptied out the water. Then she put on her wet boots again and continued on her way. As the two of them together lugged their morning catch up to the porch, I got a good look at Aniuta's face and was amazed. Her cheeks were a rosy red and her little eyes were sparkling with determination. These together with the hint of a smile on her face made her virtually unrecognizable by comparison with the sickly, sallow-skinned little girl I had met earlier. Aniuta set about rousing her grandfather. With a rather loud wheeze, he climbed down from the stove and put on a jacket. Then he took a knife and salt and proceeded to cut up the fish. In the meantime, Aniuta served me tea, and I asked her why she got up so early every morning to bring home the fish. Those fellows on the steamship on the river, they come and collect our fish, she said. They give me money, and I asked them to bring me paint for the houses in our village. They brought me the paint in exchange for the fish, along with some lovely material for a dress. For that, I gave them all the fish I had caught that week. And when she said that, she went and fetched a huge piece of magnificent silk fabric. 
Well, Ania, I observed, I see there's enough here for more than one dress. How come so much? This isn't for me. I got it ready as a present for my mamochka when my mamochka comes to see me. And I'm going to give her a beautiful shawl and a long beaded necklace. Then Aniuta opened a worn suitcase and pulled out a pair of imported women's pantyhose, a pearl necklace, and a magnificent brightly colored shawl. I don't want Momochka to be upset that she can't give me any presents. I can buy everything for her now myself. I don't want her to think she's been wasting her life. I watched as she joyfully showed me the gifts she had prepared for her mother. She was so happy admiring them. And I realized what had happened. Here, Aniuta had transformed herself from an utterly helpless, pitiful little girl waiting for somebody else to help her into an active, self-confident individual. And happy that she has known such great success, or maybe her happiness stems from an entirely different source. Now I believe that each one's happiness lies within themselves, within each one of us. It is there at a particular level of awareness. The only question is, how do we reach that level? Anastasia helped little Aniuta reach it. Will she be able to help everyone else do the same? Or maybe we ourselves need to help need to learn in some way how to figure things out ourselves. Alexander fell silent, and we each became absorbed in our own thoughts. I wrapped myself in a short, thick coat and laid my head against the log. I began looking up at the bright northern stars, and it seemed they were quite low overhead and were also being warmed by the flames of our fire. I tried to go to sleep. After about three hours' sleep at dawn, Alexander and I headed for the motorboat. But before casting off, Alexander suddenly announced, I've been thinking. Now I'm certain. It's not worth your while going into the taiga. You won't find Anastasia there now. Nobody can find her, including you. Why not? Anastasia's gone. She's gone deep into the taiga. She couldn't help leaving. If you try to go after her, you might get killed. You're not suited to the taiga. Besides, you've got to write some more to fulfill your promise to her. In order to write more, I've got to hear her answers to the many questions from my readers, questions about children, about different religions. Nobody will find her now. Why do you keep parroting, she can't be found, she can't be found? I know where her glade is. I'll find her. I tell you, you won't. Anastasia can't help but realize that there are people out to hunt her down. What do you mean they're out to hunt her down? Is somebody bribing the local hunters, just like they pay you and Yegorich? Me and Yegorich, no way. We try to persuade people not to interfere with her, not to alarm her. And if that doesn't work, we take them and let them off on the opposite shore. The local hunters can't be bribed. They've got laws and values of their own. They knew about Anastasia long before you came along. They've always treated her with great respect. They've been careful even when speaking about her amongst themselves. They don't like it when strangers show up in the taiga, and they're, and they're pretty good shots. Then who could possibly hunt her down? I think whoever has led us into the condition we find ourselves in, in at this moment, and is still leading us. Can you be more specific? Each one of us has, has to work out more specifically on their own. But still, who do you have in mind? Someone like Boris Moisevich? He's just a tool. There's something we can't see that's playing with us, and Boris Moisevich is starting to realize that now. And maybe the one who hired him has realized it too.